My summaries for B72 and Alone Together, the first two stories in Tales from the Pizza Plex Book 8, came out over the last few days. But now it's finally time for me to do a summary on the story that has been most talked about since, like, the mimic, maybe even before. Dittophobia. Not only is this a super interesting story in terms of lore, but it's actually also the final Tales from the Pizza Plex story outside of the final epilogue, which I'll of course do a summary on. So does this story hold up to the hype, and is it a good ending to Tales from the Pizza Plex? Let's find out. The story begins with our main character Rory waking up at midnight in his bed. Rory had just turned 7 a few months ago and had a birthday party with his parents and friend Wade, a small party. That seemed so long ago now even though it was a few months ago. Rory knew the routine well now. The bedroom he was in had two doors on either side of the room and a closet up ahead. The monsters were trying to enter his room. One monster was a pirate fox, one was a yellow chicken holding a similarly horrifying cupcake, and one was a purple blue bunny, which was the worst of the three since Roy had actually liked bunnies, and this one was monstrous. All three monsters were completely torn apart and had sharp teeth and claws. The monsters entered his room from each of their respective entrances. They didn't make any noise as they advanced outside of a few whirs and their thumping footsteps. Their silence made their approach even more terrifying. They reached the bed and Rory hopped off. He tried to scamper past the chicken, but a similarly tattered and terrifying brown bear shot up from under the bed, blocking his escape. Rory screamed as the monster grabbed him and pierced his skin. He later woke up and saw that the nightmare was over. He looked up at the window that he didn't understand the reason for being so high up on the wall, and saw that sunlight was pouring into the room. He looked around the room, seeing the quilt bed, the purple robot on the floor, and the purple fan on top of his chest of drawers. He heard the sound from his vent, and he found that everything was as it should be. He looked under his bed and found nothing. He called for his mom and dad, but neither of them responded. He exited his room and headed out into the hall where there was a lamp similar to the one in his room. He got ready for the day, but as he passed by the bathroom where he heard a running shower, he called for his mom and got no response. His dad was probably already at work, so Rory was on his own. Rory got a bagel and a pear out of the fridge when he got to the kitchen. They seemed to be slightly old, but they were okay. Something smelled like it went bad in the fridge. Rory ate his bagel and pear and cleaned up after himself before grabbing his backpack and heading towards the front door. He suddenly stopped. The front door was nowhere to be found. He couldn't remember where the exit of his house was supposed to be, and he couldn't find it. Also strangely, his mom still wasn't out of the shower even though it had been a while. He searched the house and found that there were a bunch of doors that he simply wasn't able to open. Furthermore, there were some rooms where he just couldn't remember what they contained. He continued walking over and over again. Eventually, he noticed the great room in his house was darker than it had been before. Daylight was somehow already fading, so Rory decided to take a shower and went to bed. He woke up again at midnight. Just like the night before, he found that his closet and both doors into his room were open despite being closed the night before. The monsters slowly made their way into his room. Rory tried to run, but when he did, another pair of eyes appeared in front of him and he screamed. He woke up again in the morning. Everything was normal again. The toys on the ground, the hissing from his vents, and sunlight, everything was normal. Rory called for his parents, but once again, they didn't answer. He went up to his closet and opened it, and there was nothing scary. Normal. He got ready for school and heard the shower running as he passed it. He was fending for himself again, which he was used to. Just like the day before, he ate breakfast, which was probably slightly expired, and searched his house for a long while, the shower still running, for an exit before it got really dark and Rory headed to bed. That night, the monsters came again. They got into his room. He tried to run again. The bear stopped him again. He screamed again. He woke up again. He called for his parents again, and they didn't answer again. Rory could hear the shower in the distance even through the hissing vents. Rory was surprised by how often his dad worked and his mom showered. He wished he saw them more. Rory was out of bagels and had a slightly moldy piece of wheat toast and an old apple for breakfast which wasn't great but it was tolerable. He realized he would be late for school if he didn't go, and he looked around the house again. For the past few days, Rory had felt loopy all day and was really tired as if he'd been staying up too late. As he continued searching his house, he suddenly began hearing a knocking sound coming from inside the walls, almost like a car's engine misfiring. An engine being in his walls obviously didn't make sense, so Rory thought the sound was weird. It was unfamiliar. It suddenly stopped, and when it did, so did the hissing of the vents and the running shower. Rory was a bit confused, but he was too tired to care. So he took a shower and went to bed. Rory woke up feeling great. He realized the reason why was because he hadn't had any nightmares. 
However, when he looked around his room, he saw that it was filthy. There was dirt everywhere. The wallpaper was coming off, there were footprints on the immensely dusty carpet, and even when Rory got up, he saw his bare legs were hairy. He called for his mom, but didn't get an answer. Even weirder though, his voice was way, way deeper, almost sounding like his dad's voice. He got up to pee and made his way to the washroom and saw himself in the mirror. He was no longer a little boy. He was so confused. Wasn't he a little boy just yesterday? Now he was a 17 year old teenager. He had no idea how he jumped ahead 10 years. He thought maybe he'd slept for 10 years. Rory was also pretty much naked so he headed back to his room to grab some clothes. The clothes though were for 7 year old Rory and they didn't fit him at all. He spent some time trying to find clothes that wouldn't rip when he wore them and he managed to but the clothes were still far too small for him, not to mention they were really dirty and smelled really bad too. Rory had to find his mom and maybe they could get new clothes. He wandered his house and found that the entire thing was completely disgusting and wrecked just like his room had been. The floor was also different than he remembered, now having a set of tracks lining it. He didn't understand why these tracks were in his house. What were they for? He made it to the kitchen and found it was also in a terrible state with ants all over the cabinets as well. The thought of the 10 year old rotten food made Rory feel sick. He opened the fridge and found that it looked completely different. A bunch of packages of vanilla wafers filled rows like a vending machine. Rory was hungry so he grabbed a wafer and ate it. It wasn't very flavorful, but it was fine. He then went over to the sink, grabbed his glass, which looked pretty clean all things considered, and filled it with water. Luckily, there was still water in the sink and it was normal. He decided he had to find his mom, so he went to her bedroom. Weirdly though, he found that her bedroom door was a fake door. Similarly, he heard the shower from the bathroom and went over to it, assuming his mom was in the shower, and he found the bathroom door to also be fake and that the shower sound came from a speaker above the door, not from the actual room itself. He wondered, if the doors and shower weren't real, was his mom real? Billy then saw the tracks extended into his room as well and right to his bed. He followed tracks to a door at the end of the hall and found that this door was real. It was a bit difficult, but he managed to open the door, and inside he found the nightmarish purple-blue bunny from his nightmares. At first, he was startled, but he realized that it was currently unmoving and not a threat to him. The bunny from his nightmares wasn't real. It was a life-sized figurine that could only move on the tracks. He moved to his closet, and then a trap door next to his bed, then the right hallway, and he found the monsters in all their respective places. It was all fake, but he didn't understand why. He searched more of his house to find that the doors that didn't open were the fake doors, and the only ones that were actually able to open were the ones to his bedroom and the ones containing all the monsters. He then investigated the fridge and found that it wasn't a fridge at all. There was a tunnel-like enclosure that extended far behind the fridge and into the wall. Rory moved all the wafers and rows out of the way and went through it, but not before grabbing a flashlight out of the kitchen drawer. There was a metal door behind the fridge that was on a concrete floor. It was flimsy and he was able to knock the whole thing off the wall. He went through the doorway and found himself in a corridor filled with gas tanks, which were connected to hoses which were fed into Rory's house. Some sort of compressed gas from these gas tanks was being pumped into Rory's house. He found a grey metal machine at the end of the corridor and beyond that was a desk with a clipboard. The clipboard had a piece of paper on it. The paper had a date listed that was just a month after his 7th birthday. There was a handwritten note next to it that said, Subject continues to react with fear to what he perceives to be creatures. Fear level, 9. Rory repeated the perceives to be part. He knew what the word perceives meant, and the wording on the paper indicated that what he perceived wasn't reality. He read through the rest of the pages on the clipboard, and he realized that everything he'd lived through following a month after his 7th birthday was completely fake. He remembered the house he was in as his own, but it wasn't. The gas in the tanks was hallucinogenic gas, which made him think that he was seeing and doing things that he really wasn't. It made him think he lived in a house with his parents, and that he had to go to school. It made him perceive the food he ate as real food, when in reality it was just the way the gas was what caused his night terrors. It was all an experiment to study the effects of fear in children. The person behind the experiment wanted to see what would happen if a kid went through the same horrors every night with no real life during the day to balance the horror. The last entry on the clipboard was 10 years ago, the same year Rory turned 7, so he assumed that it had been abandoned 10 years ago. The gas and food dispensers must have been automated. The machine he'd seen seemed to have been what pumped the gas, but it must have broken down which was why Rory had suddenly become conscious again after 10 years and why he saw through the illusions. Now everything made sense. The gas had kept him in a haze that kept him from seeing the truth of his reality. He was imprisoned. His horrors had been being monitored, but now it was just automated. No one was even watching anymore. No one was making sure Rory was okay. 
Rory decided he had to make sure the machine didn't work again, so he detached the hoses from the pump. Now the gas wouldn't be pumped into the house. Now what he had to do was get out of here. He wasn't sure where he'd go, but anywhere would be better than here. He made his way into some sort of observation room with a picture of a pigtailed robot girl and unlit lights above a large window. He moved on and found himself in a large dance floor with a ballerina on the stage. Rory saw a door on the other side of the dance floor and thought maybe it would be his way out, so he rushed towards it. He found a room with a breaker box and a bunch of wires. He flicked the switch, but it didn't seem to do anything, so he moved on. The next corridor he was in went a lot further than the previous ones, and there was a hard right that led to two different rooms. One was an area with with a bunch of animatronic parts, and the one across from it was a really big room with another stage. This one labeled Funtime Auditorium. He saw a cracked and crumpled pirate fox animatronic against the wall. This animatronic reminded him a bit of the fox that terrorized his nightmares, but this one was different. Rory continued on and did a few turns in the hallway that led him to what seemed to be another observation room which had a bunch of creepy clown faces on the walls and windows on either side. There were drawers in this room, and in one of the drawers he found blueprints labeled Underground Testing Facility, which made him realize that he was underground right now and that even the sunlight in his house was fake. He looked at the blueprints and found that beyond this control room, there was a hallway that led to an elevator that had to lead back up to the real world. World. He made his way to the elevator which had a much better smell. Unlike the rest of the facility, the elevator smelled fresh. He found posters of the pigtailed girl and the ballerina. He pressed the button to the elevator, but it didn't do anything. He realized this was because there was no power, so he headed back to the control room and looked in the last two drawers he hadn't checked. Lucky for him, one of them had a radio, which he knew how to use as he and his friend Wade used to talk through them a lot, or at least that's what he remembered. What if Wade was never real either? He turned on the radio and he found his answer. Somehow, this radio was connected to Wade's, and when he spoke into it, Wade picked up. Wade was shocked to hear Rory's voice, considering it had been 10 years. Wade asked where Rory was and caught him up about how a bunch of people searched for him and gave up after about a year. His parents didn't stop looking for a while after though, hiring a bunch of private detectives who unfortunately found nothing. Wade told him about his parents and his dog and how he actually had a 9 year old sister now. Rory felt tears roll down his face and he wondered what having a sister would be like. Wade asked when he's coming home and told him that he can meet Wade's girlfriend when he does. He had a girlfriend now and he'd never been able to stand the idea of tearing their clubhouse down, so it was still there too. Rory couldn't wait to get out of here and meet his sister and Wade's girlfriend and see all the people he cared about again, but at the same time, he had to figure out where he was. He told Wade that he didn't know where he was and explained the whole thing about the experiments in the underground facility. He provided Wade with all the details he'd found about the facility, giving a description of the house and the corridors and the facility, and Wade suggested that maybe he should try to find the generator that keeps the house's electricity going and maybe reroute it to the rest of the facility. It wasn't a bad idea, and it was the only one that they had. Wade wished they could trace his location. If only he'd had a cell phone. Rory was surprised to learn that they could even do that now, and Wade let Rory know that he'd call the police and tell them everything Rory told him. Rory thanked Wade, and they said their goodbyes for the moment before Rory turned off the radio. Rory began to search for the generator, and he made his way back into the house. It seemed to be getting late, meaning the monsters would come out again, and even though he now knew that they were just motorized mannequins, his fear of them didn't really dwindle. It was a part of him. He searched the whole house, but there was no sign of a generator. He thought maybe they could have been in one of the closets the monsters were hidden away inside. He hadn't gotten too close before, so he may have just not seen them. As he approached the closet door in the right hallway, the tattered and monstrous yellow chicken exited the closet and started to down the hall towards Rory. He said that the chicken wasn't real out loud to himself, though obviously the chicken didn't respond to this in any way. It just followed the rails into Rory's room, walking straight past him. Rory checked both closets that had contained the monsters and neither contained a generator. He then realized that he hadn't checked the cabinet in the kitchen island. In fact, he never checked any of the cabinets in his kitchen as he only ever used one glass and grabbed the flashlight out of one of the drawers, but other than that he'd never opened any of the kitchen cabinets. He checked some, but all that was inside was grey rubber. He stood up, but then he realized something. He could hear the supposed refrigerator motor, but he realized that since the refrigerator wasn't real, it wouldn't have a motor. The sound he heard heard was coming from somewhere else. He thought maybe it could be in the fake freezer, but he realized that the motor sound came from behind the rubber. He was able to pull the rubber back, and the growl of an engine filled the room. He looked up and saw that with the rubber that had been soundproofing removed, the generator was now revealed. He began pulling it out, though it was very heavy. As he started tugging on it, he heard a voice
voice say hello to him. The voice came from a speaker on the ceiling that he hadn't noticed before. The voice told Rory not to disrupt the generator because he knows Rory wants to be there, and disrupting the generator makes it impossible for him to do that as it's hooked up to a supply of gas. Rory asked who was there and why he couldn't see him. The voice seemed to be coming from a man who was probably about his dad's age. It was a low, smooth, calm, and soothing sounding voice. He wondered where this man could be and why he didn't come out to interact with him before. The voice said that Rory hadn't fit in at school and had run away from home. Rory didn't remember running away, but suddenly he didn't care about that. The voice suddenly became like a warm hug, and he closed his eyes and he could see a reassuring smile. He heard what the voice said as it talked about how Rory was an outcast that no one, not even his parents, really liked outside of Wade. But this place was his home. He'd been cared for here all these years. Rory knew the voice was right. His sister probably wouldn't even like him. No one else did. Rory realized he didn't want to return to a world where he didn't fit in. Especially after 10 years. He couldn't go home now. Whether this place was fake or not, it was the only home that he knew and the only place he'd fit in. Rory returned to the old grey machine that he'd tampered with earlier. He found that the reason the gas stopped running was because a power cord was loose, so he fixed it and reconnected the hose. The gas was now running again. Rory returned and fixed the refrigerator and the wafers lined up inside. He was so tired. He shut the fridge. He wondered why he was in front of the fridge when it was so late. He had to get to sleep. So he did. He went back to his nice, refreshing, clean, and inviting bed and snuggled in, pulling the quilt over his head, and fell asleep. Now, I'll read you guys the last few lines of the story. Quote, At the end of the concrete corridor filled with gas tanks, the gas pump tumbled steadily. In the ceiling above the pump, behind a metal grate, a tape recorder clicked. It then whirred loudly, the sound of a cassette rewinding. Another click. The cassette was once again ready for the next time Rory wandered too far. And that is the end of the final story in Tales from the Pizzaplex. All that's left now is the epilogue, which from what I've heard will be a very underwhelming ending to the series compared to this story. Didophobia is a great story. Of course it merits theories, and I will of course be doing theories on this book soon, but for right now, I just hope you guys enjoyed this video and liked the story as much as I did. But if you did enjoy this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to, and my summary of the Final Tales epilogue should be out tomorrow, hopefully, so stay tuned for that, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye guys!